Newsflash, Batman is one of the most popular fictional characters ever created, a character whose interpretation shifts to meet the sensibilities of each successive generation seeking his brand of escapist costumed vigilante justice, but whose core, the true appeal of the character, remains consistent over time regardless of the media through which his story is being told. But let the record show that even a great story about a timeless, popular character is no guarantee of success. Or, to put it another way, if someone makes a movie about Batman and no one went to see it, did it actually get released? Hi, I'm Dan Larson and this is the history of Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Capitalizing on the success of Tim Burton's Batman in 1989, scheduled to be released in 1992 on the heels of Batman Returns, Warner Brothers developed a Batman animated series called Batman the Animated Series. The look and feel were heavily inspired by Burton's interpretation of Gotham City, but even more so from the Max Fleischer Superman cartoons of the 1940s. For more on the series itself, check out our video, The History of Batman the Animated Series. Capitalizing on the success of the first season of Batman the Animated Series, Warner Brothers began development of an animated feature film. What's better than one ongoing Batman franchise in theaters? Two ongoing Batman franchises in theaters. Let's start there and see where it goes. Maybe three Batman franchises. Maybe four Batman franchises. Maybe five Batman franchises. Maybe <laughs> Batman Mask of the Phantasm is a 1993 animated feature film that set out to tell a different kind of Batman story than would traditionally be featured in either the films or the animated series. A story that digs into the who of Bruce Wayne and Batman by telling a love story. A love story with action, explosions, and the Joker, yes, but still. On the Bruce Wayne side of his life, Andrea Beaumont, a woman he previously had a deep and intimate relationship with, who he was almost married to, has returned. On the Batman side of his life, there's a new masked vigilante in Gotham who takes Batman's crime-fighting philosophy to the most extreme degree, dispensing the ultimate justice which, statistically, has a much lower rate of recidivism but relies less on burden of proof. It's the kind of Batman story that answers the question, who is Batman, with the question, what could Batman be if he weren't Bruce Wayne? And then follow-up question, who is Bruce Wayne? And the answer is yes, Batman, but more importantly, a product of his tragic past. A tragic past whose end point was not the murder of his parents, but a series of tragic events that could only result in his one-man war on crime after his ability to believe in Bruce Wayne had been completely extinguished. Batman Mask of the Phantasm was the first original feature film released by Warner Brothers Animation, preceding Space Jam by three years. It was directed by Eric Radomski and Bruce Timm, written by Alan Burnett, Paul Dini, Martin Pasco, and Michael Reeves. It was loosely based on Batman Year Two, a comic book story written by Mike W. Barr, illustrated by Paul Neary, Alfredo Alcala, Todd McFarlane, Mark Farmer, and Alan Davis. Mask of the Phantasm swaps in Phantasm for the Reaper. Both have a skull face and cloak. Both have scythe hands. The general theme of comparing the effectiveness of Batman's methods versus Reaper or Phantasm's methods remain, as does Gotham City's belief that Batman is the one responsible for murdering criminals when Phantasm or Reaper return to the city. Based on his history, it's not a very big leap to believe Batman's a murderer. The theme of Batman being the cause of problems was evident from the initial concepts for the film. In earlier versions of Mask of the Phantasm, the idea was to have Batman be confronted by his rogues gallery as the reason for their existence. Gotham City's assumption that Batman is the one killing all of the crime lords brings together the idea that Batman's vigilantism is, in reality, a big problem in Gotham and that, despite his better intentions, the cost may not be worth the results. While the story execution specifically would not be the main point of the film, it would be used later on in an episode of Batman the Animated Series called Trial after the film's release. Can't have a Batman movie without the Joker or a build-up to the Joker or the aftermath of an event involving the Joker. That said, the production was concerned that if the Joker was included, it might be too similar to the 1989 film and would cause confusion with viewers who thought he was dead and or supposed to be played by Jack Nicholson. Let the record show that no one was confused. Mask of the Phantasm was originally intended to be a direct-to-video release. However, Warner Brothers, during production, changed the plan and decided that it would be released to theaters, which changed the production schedule. And not just the production schedule, but the marketing schedule, which, sadly, is more important than the production schedule. The change in timeline not only gave the animators less time than the two-year standard to make a feature film, but also required them to go back over previously completed work to make it fit the new cinematic aspect ratio instead of the television aspect ratio. To be fair, 
Warner Brothers also gave them more money to make the movie. A good time to remind you that if you're suffering from working too much, just rub a little money on it and you'll feel better. A bigger budget meant longer scenes, bigger set pieces. The creators went so far as to plan ahead for the return to the small screen by creating a computer-generated version of Gotham City that could potentially be used later on during animated series production to save time and money creating backgrounds. Batman Mask of the Phantasm drew on the already strong cast of voice actors from the animated series. Kevin Conroy as Batman, Mark Hamill as the Joker, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. as Alfred, future Lois Lane Dana Delaney as Andrea Beaumont, Stacey Keach as Carl Beaumont, and Abe Vigoda as Salvatore Valestra. The soundtrack for Mask of the Phantasm was composed by Shirley Walker. Shirley was also the composer for the animated series itself. She had lots of talented musicians working with her, including Hans Zimmer on Synthesizer. He's the guy who would ultimately compose the music for the Dark Knight trilogy, Man of Steel, and Batman vs Superman, which makes it sound like he was just some guy playing a guitar and caught a big break working on Mask of the Phantasm. He already had composed the music for Rain Man, Days of Thunder, Backdraft, and Thelma and Louise, among others. challenge is phantasm. So Total Armor Batman prepares for high-tech battle, powering up to take down evil in the electronic crime stalker vehicle. He fires. Phantasm finished. Vehicle and figures each sold separately. Can't have a Batman movie without some movie merch. Although when it comes to an animated Batman movie, I wouldn't blame you for being surprised that there wasn't more stuff on shelves than there was. Kenner was already producing Batman the Animated Series figures, so they rolled out a line of repackaged, repainted Batman figures, Joker, and a super spoilery Phantasm figure, which spoiled the big reveal of the film that I won't spoil for you right now if you haven't already seen it or figured it out, even from the basic plot info already communicated in this video. Two novelizations of the film were released, and DC Comics published a comic book version written by Kelly Puckett and drawn by Mike Parabek. And that was it. A major studio releasing a Batman animated movie without an all-encompassing retail saturation cross-marketing campaign? How'd that work out for you? Warner Brothers originally intended for Batman Mask of the Phantasm to be released on home video, but Warner Brothers had a fever for Batman, and the only cure was more Batman. <laughs> Batman Returns, the highly anticipated 1992 sequel to the 1989 genre-redefining Batman, was a box office success. Batman the Animated Series was a critical success. Warner Brothers made the mid-production decision to push up the release date of Mask of the Phantasm by a whole year while simultaneously increasing the production budget, which is good because you're going to have to pay a lot of overtime to get this thing done on time. The release date was set for December 25th, 1993, a day that everyone leaves open for going to the movies. But to be fair, there wasn't a lot of animated or superhero fare to compete with. Tombstone, Schindler's List, What's Eating Gilbert Grape, Philadelphia, The Pelican Brief, Grumpy Old Men, Wayne's World 2. The excitement of not having a single competitor must have been intoxicating. Also intoxication-inducing was the revelation that no one went to see it in theaters when it finally opened. I know for a fact because I was working at a theater at the time. We had seven theaters, and it went in theater number seven, which is where we put the films that are almost at the end of their run. It's where movies go to die or that were dead on arrival. Bad speakers, dim screen, sticky floor, broken chairs, and an obnoxious usher who would talk to anyone about his dream of one day hosting a show about pop culture on a computer that works like a TV. Despite overwhelmingly positive critical reception, the lack of advanced marketing doomed it to failure. No Happy Meal tie-in, no Super Bowl commercial, no Nintendo game. On a budget of six million... Dollars. I almost said bat bucks for some reason. <laughs> on a budget of six million dollars, Batman Mask of the Phantasm drew a total of 5.8 million dollars, only missing breaking even by $200,000. Surely a moral victory if not a monetary success, and can you really put a price on that? The filmmakers who delivered a critically acclaimed film blame the lack of marketing on the film's initial failure. I blame the lack of marketing on the film's initial failure. <laughs> and it's important that all of us recognize what a colossally poor decision it was to invest six million dollars in a product that, ultimately, was a more theatrical version of what would have already been a compelling story and was being produced at a much lower cost. Congratulations, Warner Brothers. You played yourself. It wasn't until after the film was released on home media that the film found its audience and became a financial success. Even Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert, God rest their thumbs, lamented that they were not able to view the film as intended in theaters. I'm sorry we caught up with this picture a couple years late, but it's available on tape and disc. I watch it at home on Laserdisc, and with a booming surround sound system, 
Batman Mask of the Phantasm was big time entertainment. I really liked it. You know, I think that the day is coming and it's also happening with the Disney pictures when adults are realizing that animation is not limited to right. an entertainment form for children. Mark Hamill was so excited to see the film in theaters that he and his wife went to a premiere on Christmas. As he told the story to The Hollywood Reporter, quote, we were living in New York at the time and I was so excited. We got to the theater and there was maybe 12 people. The people that were there were all diehard fans of the animated series and they recognized me, end quote. Initially, he tried to maintain his Hollywood distance from them, as we all do, but later realized that it was a giant empty theater and invited them to come over and sit with him to watch it. Mark believed that, even with the rushed production, the film was still excellent and worthy of theatrical release, blaming, again, the lack of marketing. Quote, there weren't any ads on Saturday Night Live or any of the normal places you see a film advertised, end quote. Mask of the Phantasm was released on VHS and Laserdisc in 1994. It was released on DVD in 1999, and then again in 2004 and 2005, and then again in 2008. It hit Blu-ray in 2017, and then again as part of the complete animated series box set in 2018. We know the story of Bruce's parents' murder. We've seen him sitting in his study as a bat flies through his window, inspiring his decision to become the bat. Mask of the Phantasm attempted to provide more insight into the circumstances of Bruce Wayne's life leading up to that precise moment, the things that were in his heart and mind beyond the murder of his parents years before. Unlike other characters from the animated series, particularly Harley Quinn, Andrea Beaumont wasn't fast-tracked into mainstream DC Comics continuity. She made an appearance in 2005's Justice League Unlimited episode Epilogue, where she almost plays a key role in Terry McGinnis' path to becoming Batman's successor, but is overcome by the power of Batman's legacy, deciding not to commit murder. Phantasm has appeared in some video games, but it wasn't until an announcement in June of 2019 that she and some elements of her history with Bruce Wayne might be introduced into continuity. As of this video, that series written by Tom King is scheduled for release in January of 2020. Batman Mask of the Phantasm's path to fan appreciation and financial success wasn't a direct route, but time has allowed for the story to reach beyond those who made the journey and found it in theaters. It is now viewed as one of the best Batman movies, one of the best superhero movies, one of the best animated films ever made. In 2010, IGN called it the 25th best animated film of all time. In 2011, Total Film called it one of the greatest animated movies of all time, ranking it 47th out of 50. Time Magazine called it one of the 10 best superhero films ever in 2011, and I personally saw it in theaters in 1993 and said, wow, that was pretty good. Thanks for watching. Please hit like. Hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toy galaxy. Please share this video and let us know in the comments down below if you saw Mask of the Phantasm in theaters or on home video in the years that followed. And where, where does it rank? I put it ahead of Batman and Robin, Batman Forever, and almost every Ben Affleck Batman appearance. For me, it's still behind both Keaton films and the entire Dark Knight trilogy. I am nothing if not a fountain of hot takes. <laughs> hot take machine. <laughs> Cut.